know that. You can include it. Well, thank you very much, Bert, for asking for this little chat about the past. Well, the past is getting kind of long. <laughs> it is really. Uh, it takes a little bit of digging to get into the mind of the uh, remember the old things. There is nothing terribly interesting or particularly important from point of view of evolution of what I have been doing later of my childhood. Me and my parents were living in Budapest, Hungary, and the family had been established in the town of Budapest for quite a few, quite a long time. And in fact, uh, I've been born, so was my mother in the uh, royal palace in Budapest, on top of the hill, the so-called royal hill. And uh, because my grandfather was, uh, he was an architect actually, but uh, he was hired in by the court of Franz Joseph, the emperor of Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he became a, a, a advisor of the emperor. So he was a significant kind of individual, and he had a whole wing of the, I mean, a small wing of the of the royal palace, and that's where we live for two, three generations. And <clears throat> anyway, I uh, attended school, elementary school nearby, right in the middle of the city, and uh, went to high school, a very good school indeed. And uh, after that, I could say that there was no very particular reason why I would have chosen what I did, chemical engineering, but it surely was the toughest, and it was also the toughest to get into. And I guess that was just a challenge to me at that point, without the very obvious affection to the science of that particular type, that is chemical engineering. But I was certainly interested very much. And uh, there were some 1,500 applicants for a slot of something like 60. And uh, it was hard to get into that. And I got into it. And uh, uh, toward my uh, end of my third year, uh, the war was closing uh, in a terrible manner in that part of the world. And uh, uh, the government at that time decreed by law that the two upper class of the top universities, the students would be withdrawn from the Russian troops that were just a hundred miles away at that time. And of course, as everybody knows, Budapest went through it terrific siege lasting three months, destroying much of the town. Anyway, by law, I was taken out into Germany, Eastern Germany, and uh, I was in Dresden at a time when it was destroyed. That day, I was there, and uh, with uh, quite a few of my colleagues uh, uh, killed there on the big bombing. And then uh, we got a refuge somewhere in Bavaria, and uh, it was me three, with three of my, uh, my colleagues, uh, chemical engineering uh, uh, class, that actually uh, left that thing and went back to Hungary on phony paper that I manufactured myself. I slipped into the German control officer's office at night and uh, made a so-called march that failed, that is military orders marching orders, and I gave the dress back in Hungary with that. So using that, they could have shot us any time, of course, they almost did, in fact, on our way back. But it did take us back to Hungary half a year ahead of the rest of the 2,000 folks who, from the university who were out there in Germany. Anyway, so I got back with three of my uh, classmates, first from all the university people, uh, back in May 1945, and uh, then I got into the uh, university, that was the Polytechnic University of Hungary in Budapest. That was the prime university for engineering and engineering-related sciences. And uh, <coughs> that was not too easy to 
to work there because you have to build the university, the walls, the electricity, so on and so forth. We did that in the night, uh, but then we worked pretty hard in the time. Anyway, uh, in the chemistry, there were several, uh, two particularly outstanding professors. One was in, in organic chemistry and uh, Professor Zemplain, and the other one was in, in uh, industrial chemistry, Professor Varga. Professor Varga uh, uh, was the one who discovered molybdenum sulfide as a catalyst, hydrogenated catalyst, and so all the German work in the field of coal hydrogenation is really uh, have been following his work. They have not acknowledged it though, interestingly. So we had big fights with Hitler's Germany. He has been pursued uh, because of that. But he was the great discoverer at a very, very young age. A magnificent, wonderful person. And I thank him a lot because I was just finishing my third, uh, uh, third year. When he called me once in, uh, from the laboratory, I was doing experiment uh, as a student. And he asked me, would you like to work uh, with me? And uh, that was a, a, a tremendously uh, good thing for me. It's a, a real distinct honor. And of course, I said yes. And that <coughs> set my uh, life for quite a few years. And uh, as soon as I got my degree, I was appointed in some way as a as a as a teaching assistant, and then as soon as I got my doctorate, two years later, I was appointed assistant professor, two years later associate professor. So I have been involved very deeply. I was also associate director two, uh, two years later on uh, of a research institute, which is just like yours here, but uh, was a, a government uh, established research institute for high pressure chemistry. High pressure chemistry really meant catalysis with hydrocarbons. That was a petroleum industry, energy industry related uh, research institution. And I was something like 27 or something like that at that time, but I got my doctorate three years before. And uh, uh, there was an opportunity in Hungary at that time, and the reason why that uh, institution was established. There are two. One was the great Professor Varga was available to carry out the research and in the field with his great reputation in the past going back. And also because Hungary at that time had a brand new petroleum field, an oil field, and that was extremely heavy stuff. It had 40% distillation residue. It was enormously heavy stuff. It was really a tar, substantially. And clearly, it needed something novel in chemistry to render uh, this uh, distillation residue uh, uh, useful uh, into useful products. Uh, interestingly, the hydrogen content of that thing was uh, pretty high. It is just that it was interlocked the molecules with a lot of sulfur, as we know in chemistry, that happens. And because of that, uh, the distillation, uh, boiling range of the distillable things became very little. And most of the uh, long hydrocarbons, uh, they were interlinked by, by sulfur, condensed with sulfur. At any rate, uh, uh, suddenly, that was still uh, in the, sometime in 1950, that uh, I had a, a finding in the laboratory, a details I will admit that seemed a method to allow the catalytic breakdown of, the, of these heavy molecules uh, at a much more favorable condition, very mild condition relative to what has been known at the time. And that discovery uh, then, which was also patented, and uh, uh, Hungary had the government then had an interest to to try to evolve it. And the way to do that was, it seemed that the best thing to do is to go where such thing is commercially applicable. And that was in East Germany. At that time, of course, Hungary was governed by the uh, 
Islamic uh, rulers, uh, despotic rulers, uh, but they had a very good relationship with the East German government, uh, also communist system. And so Germany had all those enormous uh, old German coal hydrogenation, tar hydrogenation plants, and what evolved very quickly in a year or two that our data that I have been generating first in grand scale in the lab, it, uh, the Germans got very much interested, and uh, so there was an offer that uh, they would render after pilot plant study, which was conducted in Hungary in our laboratory, in our institute. Uh, I was serving both as associate professor at the university as well as associate director of the institute. The institute itself had pilot plants and laboratories outside the university in, in the industrial plant, about 100 miles from, from, uh, from Budapest. So I commuted there also uh, weekly. And uh, after adequate uh, uh, pilot plant data, which we built about a ton a day scale, uh, then the idea was to introduce this process, the hydrogenation process for this heavy, heavy, very heavy petroleum product uh, into Germany in a full-scale plant, a huge, enormous, big plant. So I was uh, going there uh, with uh, my associates, half a dozen of them or so, uh, Hungarian chemists, chemical engineers, uh, who were my associates back at that research institute, and he introduced it with the help of, of the East Germans into this enormous plant. That was in 1956. In the meantime, uh, when our pilot plan data turned out to be very successful, indicating that the upgrading of this heavy petroleum could be carried out at one sixth, one eighth of the pressure that what has been used in uh, the German uh, high pressure hydrogenation plants, uh, then <coughs> I uh, received Hungary's highest price. Uh, that was in 1953. I can't forget it because I, uh, that was the time of Stalin's death. I was at that time in Prague. It was a, a tremendous event, I remember. We didn't know it. I was there with Professor Varga. We were just sitting in a restaurant one afternoon for a cup of beer uh, with a third friend, colleague of ours, back from Budapest in Prague. And uh, we didn't see anybody in that restaurant. And slowly the waiter came in, and uh, he was mumbling. And uh, I tried to find out what's the matter. He was, the man was out, out of his mind, obviously. And uh, we didn't speak Czech. We spoke German, and every Czech person speaks also German very well. What you had to do is first to ask them English. Do you speak English? They, of course, didn't. And then you could speak German. You establish you are not German, then they would be happy to speak German. <laughs> anyway, and the waiter came, and he was mumbling. And uh, then finally, I asked him for, for a couple of for a beer or something like that for three of us. And he was still mumbling. And then slowly, we began to make it out in German. He says that the, that the beast is dying. <laughs> the beast was Stalin, as it turned out. But he was just out of his mind. That, and of course, one day later, the, it was announced that he was dead. And uh, I remember we went back to Hungary that day. And the people were dancing on the streets. It was a tremendous moment to see. Anyway, a uh, week after arriving back, it was announced the yearly uh, national awards. I got it in <coughs> for science and technology. And uh, I was 29 at that time. And then, uh, just a little bit later, as this uh, work evolved with the hydrogenation of this heavy petroleum, uh, in 1956, we were there to introduce it into, into uh, this plant. Of course, a lot of research work in other related fields have been carried out. And I was there in East Germany when uh, we just finished this large-scale experiment uh, successfully. 
and uh, I was at dinner at the host uh, house, one of the German colleagues, and he was proudly saying to me that, well, you know, I have a very good radio. I can, I can get Budapest time. I was particularly interested to listen to the uh, Kami uh, tirades, which always came from the radio. But I said, by all means. So he turned it on, and there, at that moment, I found out there is a revolution in Hungary. It was quite a drama. I had no idea. And there I heard on the radio, there is a revolution. <coughs> As it turned out, instantly I want to go back into Hungary, but the Czechs would not permit uh, the Hungarians, who were conceived to be against the communist system, they would not permit me to cross into uh, uh, through Czechoslovakia to go back to Hungary. And then after some days, I have uh, gotten calls from Budapest, from relatives, family, so on and so forth. And I was begged not to go back, but to go to Vienna and wait there and stay. That's what I did. I flew into Hungary, uh, into Vienna, and stayed there actually half a year. And to make it a little bit uh, short, I was staying uh, in Vienna, and I was invited if I want to work at the University of Vienna in the chemistry area. And uh, well, I had the feeling that uh, there are two choices for me, either go back to Hungary, which I desperately wanted to do, or if I go, I would rather go to the opposite end of the world uh, to go as far as possible. Uh, my parents were still back in Hungary, and all my friends, and of course, <coughs> my greatly beloved uh, Professor Varga. And actually he died by the end of that year, 1956. He had lung cancer and that uh, took him away. By that time I had uh, quite a few publications and uh, so I began to write around uh, a relevant uh, industry in the West and I uh, got responses and I got uh, uh, offers uh, to work in the United States. And uh, details don't really matter, but uh, I chose uh, to come to the United States on the invitation of the National Academy of Sciences, had a, a deal there, uh, had, a, had the folks there in Vienna collecting Hungarian scientists and uh, we were offered to come to the United States without obligation whatsoever, without ties. And I have chosen to take that round. So I came here uh, uh, to the United States 1957, uh, beginning of 1957, uh, with that uh, invitation uh, that provided already uh, the so-called green card at that time. And uh, I had in my pocket uh, job offers uh, in several of the industries. Details I met, but uh, one of them was from Union Carbide Corporation, an extremely uh, favorable offer. And uh, actually, I visited them on the first day I arrived in New York, and uh, I was greatly impressed and accepted the job. And so I went off to Buffalo a union carbide in the division's laboratory for gas business, the gas separation business and the like. And that was a magnificent choice, and that was a magnificent laboratory. In that laboratory with about three, four hundred people, uh, they have discovered about one third of silicon chemistry of the, at that time. Uh, they have developed the most advanced uh, gas separation technologies uh, they have discovered uh, uh, synthetic zeolites, uh, and among other things, uh, they were working on synthetic diamond. Matter of fact, the, uh, one of the uh, great advances of the early times right after the war resulted from that uh, uh, work, synthetic diamond, namely uh, Bill Eversol, a uh, uh, very fine uh, uh, engineer. He was uh, studying uh, 
how to make diamonds at uh, 30, 40,000 atmospheres, of course, very small scale. When he read an article uh, from England, how to make polyethylene at high pressure, that was before they catalytic polyethylene, of course. And uh, uh, that was an ICI patent. That, uh, I think it was some two, 4,000 atmospheres was required to carry out the radical uh, polymerization of, of, of ethylene. And then seeing that, he, he called one of his friends at Union Carbide at Charleston, where Union Carbide has the major uh, research laboratory at that time, and uh, asked one of, the, one of his colleagues, that, uh, have you read this patent uh, about the polyethylene, how to make polyethylene from ethylene? All these, these fellows said, of course we did, but there is no interest in it. We don't um, build processes at 4,000 atmospheres. Well, this Bill Eversole said, why don't you come visit me next week, show you how to do it. And indeed he did. And a matter of fact, he already had the uh, design of the valves at this pressure in miniature scale. And as I heard the story, within one year, Union Carbide did build the first commercial plant of high pressure polyethylene. That is not the Ziegler polyethylene, but the high pressure polyethylene. <coughs> All you have to do is to get some uh, old uh, uh, cannons, cannon tubes, and uh, that was uh, uh, no problem at all to, to develop uh, that product worldwide scale. Union Carbide manufactured two thirds, uh, more than half of that kind of polyethylene before the development of the catalytic craft. Uh, I arrived there in May 1957 with the charter from the president of Union Carbide Corporation uh, who asked me to look into possibilities that these new molecular sieves, uh, zeolites, had been discovered, the synthetic route, by Bob Milton. And Bob Milton needs somebody to look into the possibility to, to try to make these uh, zeolites somehow catalytic, to try to apply them as a catalyst. So that was my job. And uh, I was given in Buffalo a, a small group with a PhD chemist and uh, another chemist uh, with a master's degree, outstanding, very fine folks, and some outstanding technicians. And so we build equipment and so on and so forth. And uh, six months later, we have uh, uh, discovered not only the strong acidity of zeolites, but already the, the y zeolite, the strong acid forms of y zeolite that is since that time making uh, out the gasoline on earth. That, of course, such a monumental discovery as an enormous fraction of four of one. I was given that task, but we have been looking at the right thing. Uh, we have been interested in how to utilize this novel surface of an intracrystalline surface of a zeolite by being interested in the fact that there you have a oxide ions forming these channels and pores within the crystal, but there are unusual things there that they are so-called cations associated with the aluminum content within the zeolite crystal, and those ions provide uh, a very low coordination. They are sitting out there in a large channel of like eight, nine angstrom size, maybe even, even more, without counter ions, oxide ions, near to them. So they are they are exposed, and the electrostatic field uh, was was what attracted me from the first moment I had been hired to try to. Uh, to build on that, and then we have been fortunate that uh, uh, the preliminary experiments uh, to the uh, ultimate discovery was that we had applied it to axiolite, and then we introduced uh, bivalent ions into the axiolite. That was an amazing high acid activity of that material, which was interesting because by that time I had made a large uh, total literature search, and I just, I just had on top of my desk 
Professor Emmett, Paul Emmett's paper was published within a year at that time that says that uh, acidity, protic acidity, is poisoned quantitatively, stoichiometrically, by the presence of cations, all cations. And he had not only sodium, he had calcium, he had barium, uh, so he had multivalent cations present in his examples, bivalent cations he had there. So it has been, I remember the day when I was contemplating this, this work, I said, this is the chance uh, to use uh, multivalent ions in the system. And fortunately, it, it, it came true. The axiolite then was uh, of limited use, even though it has been used in the industry. It has been ordered at that time by the industry. Uh, Union Carbide disclosed that and distributed it, so anybody who wanted can, could do experiments with it. I have not dwelt with it because uh, uh, when I then decided to form the protic form, the most uh, interesting protic form, that is ammonium exchange and thermalizing the ammonium exchange form to get the direct protic form, uh, there's a beautiful crystal of axiolite collapsed totally, 100%, and the activity was nothing, uh, nothing of any interest. So at that time, uh, my friend and uh, one of the great uh, uh, pioneers of zeolite science, Don Breck, just a year before, discovered the so-called zeolite Y. It was the same structure as the X, as well as, as the mineral fogesite, uh, but it was a little more silicious. It had uh, uh, more than twice the silicon content relative to the axiolite. But at the time of my st first studies, uh, that material was barely known, even in our own laboratory. And it existed only in sub gram quantities, just a little bit of, of, of that material. We were also dealing with the problem of uh, characterizing crystals. And uh, if I say the crystal was retained or, or lost, I have to mention that uh, Somewhere around that time, Linus Pauling visited our lab. That was before my time. And uh, uh, Don Bragg did, and, and uh, Bob Milton did show uh, Pauling uh, the diffraction pattern of these uh, microporous materials. And uh, Pauling looked at it on the structure of uh, X and Y. And uh, as everybody, it was obvious to anybody that he has a face center cubic lattice because of the nature of the, the evolution of the development of the peaks at high and then higher to, to theta uh, uh, angle changes. But it also had a peak at an extremely low two theta value, which disclosed, without knowing the details of the structure, an enormous unit cell, 24 angstrom. So, Linus Pauling said that uh, he has grave uh, uh, doubts about the quick solution of the uh, crystallographic problem I mean, to clarify the structure because there's an enormous number of, of atoms in the unit cell and very few information because of the very high symmetry, face centered cube, tremendous symmetry. So very few data is coming out, particularly because of the material existed in microcrystalline form, about one, two micron size. So it has to be a powder uh, uh, X-ray print. And actually, it turned out that uh, right after his, he left, uh, the mineral forgesite a deposit was found in Germany, in, in the middle of Germany. And that provided uh, Dambrek with uh, the with, uh, single crystals of the size of a few hundred micron. And so he could do the crystallographic work with the single crystal and he cracked the structure very soon after that. A two minute break. Okay. Now, do you know how Brecht found out about the natural Foggia site in Germany? Gee, I don't. I don't. Uh, in 
It was in Kaiserlautern, uh, Germany, near the railroad station, I know. It was a small little uh, nucleus of a, of a find. Most fortunate because for decades after that, that find provided the single crystals for all the zeolite uh, crystallographers on Earth to carry out their single crystal studies. Because the, uh, the material, the synthetic material is, is, is very small. You could <laughs> grow to 10, 15 uh, micron scale, a little bit of it if you select out from the normal uh, size material. But the normal size crystals are just uh, one, around one uh, micron uh, size, very small. And that's, of course, you can do uh, zinc crystal work with that. <coughs> you lose a lot of information. And of course, it should be mentioned that I'm, I'm talking about time when there was no computers yet. Mm -hmm. So we used the Monroe uh, uh, calculator, you know, going forward, backward, and juggling back forth. Well, at the time that they were working on synthesis of zeolites at Union Carbide, what was the philosophy or how, how did they... Uh, decide what kind of experiments to do, uh, what was the guiding light of directing the synthesis? Was it just try this and see what happens? Or? Well, I hate to speak for the people who were the discoverers. I was not. I have yeah. not synthesized the new zeolite. I strictly work with the product as already made. I was interested in the chemistry and catalysis. So that those people were uh, uh, Bob Milton, who discovered the first uh, zeolite, A and X. Tremendous discovery, of course. He discovered the concept, how to make such things. 100, 200 years, people have been trying to do that unsuccessfully. And it is Milton who conceived how to imitate nature uh, in the synthesis of these this things, the logical and uh, just a wonderful chemical concept that he followed. Anyway, uh, uh, then Dan Breck, who discovered Weisseolite and is responsible for many of the fundamental aspects of crystal, crystal light. He, he developed the structure, uh, he determined the structure crystallographically of the, of the fungicide and uh, uh, made immense contribution uh, summarized in his book uh, on zeolites, uh, which appeared uh, in the 60s, mid, mid 60s, and third, uh, Edie Flanagan, who has been uh, the third of the uh, three greats who have been uh, making new zeolites at Edie Carbide Corporation, Milton, Breck, and Flanagan. And of course, uh, Flanagan continued it uh, for decades later on with her associates. But at any rate, the idea at that point was really driven by the conceived utility of such things in separation processes. That division of human carbide, an enormous chemical company, that division of that company was interested in separating gases, liquids, separation technology, purification as well. And so it was conceived that given a, a molecular sieve capability by having well-defined pores onto which only molecules fit that are smaller in diameter, in second dimension, uh, than the port of those pore openings, uh, will be already itself a thing. For example, uh, water molecule is very small, so it would be <coughs> able to use such things as drying agents. But beyond that, of course, the industry, the chemical industry, and particularly the petroleum industry, provided enormous opportunities, not to mention uh, that uh, the natural gas purification of sulfur and all sorts of things. But the conceived benefits were just enormous. So it was really, uh, that was the basis of, at that time, of the of Bob Melton, and as well as the management uh, behind him, 
in their conception where the utilities lie. But of course, Milton hired me with the, the and the company management with a definite objective to develop catalytic opportunities. Uh, by then, the adsorption and separation and uh, studies were conducted with, uh, in a large, brand new laboratory built by Unicar by, and headed by Bob Milton, uh, carrying out both research as well as development and synthesis of new materials uh, with the immediate objective to commercialize the use of this uh, molecular sieves in separation technology, which they did with an enormous industry to the other but also with the hope that something new might pop out in chemistry, more in the chemistry, in catalysis. It certainly was intriguing that you have something that has uniform surface, uh, up to 800 square meter per gram surface area, vastly more than any other uh, kind of uh, high surface material that was available at that time. And ever since, it is an enormous opportunity. And we have been fortunate. Within six months, we not only discovered acidic forms of the exivite, but we tracked the why. Of course, the interest was after we found that the uh, protein form of exivite is not the multivalent cation form, but the pure protein form, H form of exivite, is completely losing crystal structure. I was uh, determined to try the Wiseolite. Since it existed only in gram quantities, I persuaded my friends uh, under Dan Breck, uh, who is the discoverer of the composition of the Wiseolite, to make me a scale up batch, and or two, something like that. And they did. And I got that uh, uh, sometime in September, end of September. Uh, 1957. And so it gave us an opportunity. It may be 40 years today, or suddenly within a week, that's when we did the work. And we got to the point that, of course, multivalent cation Y was beating multivalent cation X in every respect. But the H form, the pure H form, the ammonium uh, Y derived form of the zeolite was the real winner. And I never forget the, uh, the response of my associate uh, when we first uh, made the first experiment, Jim Boyle. Uh, after the experiment, uh, Jim came to me and said that uh, uh, we lost it. He says, uh, we have to repeat the experiment. I said, why? He says that uh, obviously the thermocouple system broke down. Why is that? He says, well, we had a very high conversion. That was an isomerization experiment. <coughs> very high conversion at 100 degrees lower temperature than silica alumina. And of course, everybody on Earth finds the same ever since. That was the, uh, the, the key discovery. Now, uh, what led you to ammonia exchange and decompose it? That was completely uh, obvious, because that was in the literature. That is how the, uh, the acidic alumina uh, has been applied as a result of uh, Egloff and others, and many others uh, at, uh, in the 1930s, that you apply the ammonium ion and then thermalize the ammonia that allows the proton left behind to attack an oxide ion and you make it acidic, uh, 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 the acidic form. Uh, the problem chemically there is that uh, uh, the proton has enormous electron affinity. It is 15 eV. Uh, 15 eV is a tremendous uh, electron affinity relative to something like uh, sodium. Uh, Sodium plus has a uh, electron affinity of four and a half eV. So it's three times more. So when you apply an actual proton, which you do when you uh, remove the ammonia from the ammonium ion, uh, 
and you plunge, you attack the oxygens for whatever you have underneath, and oxygen is the is the atom in this case, oxide ion, uh, with a tremendous electron affinity, the small size of the proton, and its electron affinity is deadly, really, it does demand the satisfaction to provide it with electron density. And then, of course, uh, jumping way ahead, uh, that is really the puzzle that uh, it took us from 1957 to 19, in the late 70s, why we have been able to provide the very first inkling on what is the reason for the strong acidity of, of YZOI. It was in the industry for decades by then, in FCC, in hydrocracking, worldwide. Uh, alpha gasoline probably was made 50% of the gasoline with these tanks, with these catalysts. And we still have not been able to understand what exactly is the reason for the strong acidity. We understood a lot of other things, and we have done an awful lot of chemistry. I could say a word or two on that. In the after discovering YCOI, uh, right at that time, Unicarbide Corporation, the second largest chemical firm on earth at that time, uh, decided to build a central corporate research uh, laboratory, which is called Research Institute, Unicarbide Research Institute, near New York City at Teddy Town. And uh, I was offered to jobs, one in Charleston, and uh, the other one was at Terry Town to form a department of uh, surface chemistry and catalysis, of course, mainly catalysis. And that was a pretty magnificent institution. It had uh, scientific tools, uh, tremendous scientific tools, including in the nuclear reactor, uh, in a nearby laboratory with 30% uranium. Every kind of spectroscopy was available that was known at that time, almost. And uh, I was particularly interested to explore the possibilities provided by this microspherical uh, uh, intracrystalline surface of zeolites. Since we already discovered the strong acidity of, of zeolites, and of course, needless to say that we have done, uh, uh, nobody knew about the existence of Wyzeolite for the first two and a half years. So I had lots of time beyond the discovery to establish a pen position based upon many experiments in cracking, in hydrocracking, isomerization, all sorts of reactions, so that we had a completely uh, powerful and broad and deep unique position in the field, two composition matter patents under my name and my associate's name uh, was obtained later on in the years uh, to cover the compositions of multivalent cation Y as an acid composition, as well as catalyst for all sorts of uh, applications, as well as the H, direct H form of the Y zeolite. Actually, it was broader, the patent itself, because it said any molecular seed, that is any zeolitic material that is capable of absorbing benzene was under one of my patents in the, in the strong acid form. But we were very much interested to see what is the implication of this unique environment to, to new chemistry. One thing that we certainly imagine we have is extraordinary electros electrostatic fields showering out from those uh, multivalent cations sitting on the pores of, of, the, of the zeolite. So first thing we did is we began to calculate what are those fields. So with one of my associates there at the Unicarbide Corporate uh, Research Department, we have began to calculate. And that was 1961, the first IBM uh, frame mainframe computer was not existing yet, but a few months later. And uh, so we began to calculate with the Monroe calculator going back and forth. And uh, we actually first began to 
grow the crystal, we were interested how the data converts the field. We want to know the short-range effect and the long-range effects as we grow the crystal. So we grow it uh, based upon the crystallographic data. It was very interesting how the convergence of the, how, uh, how big a crystal we had to grow uh, while we found convergence. And we found that we had to go to 100,000 uh, atoms to find convergence impressing us that we are now with a more ionic type system, we uh, must be paying attention to the long range aspects. It's just as important as the short range aspects to the crystal. And uh, then as soon as we began that, uh, the, the first IBM mainframe computer uh, was, uh, was available and, uh, and the Unicarb I bought one and uh, it was set up in New York at headquarters, and uh, from Monday morning to Friday night, it was used for important things like uh, calculating salaries and uh, <laughs> helping process data. I'm just kidding. And, uh, and so business-related things. But from Friday night to Monday morning, we had it. And I never forget it. Once I was sitting there in this business of uh, calculating uh, uh, electrostatic phenomena in zeolites. I was there on a Sunday morning, like 3 or 4 a.m. And what you had to do is to write your Fortran program, and they throw it into the machine through, uh, uh, through the help of, of a technician. Then he would put it in uh, with cards. And then <coughs> uh, the machine uh, did uh, review the logic and then threw it back at you. You, you dumb bastard, you correct your logic here, your logic there, you know, and gave the corrections. And then you went back at uh, 3 a.m. to your uh, little hole there, made the corrections, and then you have to do that while the computer, after consuming all that stuff you gave it, the uh, program, suddenly punched out the uh, a line saying execution. As soon as the execution line came out, you knew you had it. Now <laughs> comes the data. And I remember I was there uh, having received several reprimands from the machine for my lack of logic and this and that. And I was leaning at, uh, at, the, at the printer. And I look at it, and suddenly a line jumps out there. <coughs> says, don't lean at me. I'm getting nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, the technician was used to our slow cares working there over the weekend, over nights. And when somebody got too anxious, he threw in a card <laughs> with this message. <laughs> I leave three feet. But anyway, we were able to use this. Uh, uh, then, then we had total computer help and so on and so forth. And we then applied evil sums and uh, expressed the the infinity of the crystal, and we got information of this type. And the information that we got was that uh, the electrostatic field of a, a near a bivalent ion into space, into the middle of the pore, two angstrom away, where it would be effective to affect, a, induce a dipole from any bond that's getting there, like a CH bond or something like that. That is how far you have to go, two, two and a half angstrom away to the half of the bond that you're intending to affect. And uh, we found the electrostatic fields uh, of uh, two volt per angstrom, thing like that. Of course, with the assumption that the zeolite was fully ionic, but you have corrected for what you assumed was the actual case, like a turb or so, then you still had electrostatic fields of up to one volt per angstrom, polarizing a CH bond or whatever bond you absorb there. And that was, uh, that would match any electrostatic field that was available at that time. And the best field ionization microscope anybody built, was able to build. Of course, there the limitation was that you had to the tip, the radius of the platinum tip, uh, provided the limitation to the electrostatic field. 
and nobody could make it uh, uh, much smaller than 400 angstrom, 500 angstrom, something like that. So, and I knew that uh, fields of that type, they ionized everything. There is no molecule that wouldn't be ionized with that kind of a, a, a Volker angstrom electrostatic field in a field ionization microscope. But then the difference is that in a field ionization microscope, the electron is conducted away by, uh, by a conductor, the platinum. But uh, in the case of zeolite, the problem was we had the field, so the polarization had to be there, no doubt. But the zeolite is an insulator. It cannot accept the electron. It polarizes, but it doesn't ionize that readily. Anyway, I uh, only mentioned that, that we had very deep kind of feelings, senses about what is the basic nature of the chemistry of, of, of those things. That made me then to be interested in uh, forming subvalent state of metal ions. And uh, well, that was in 1961 or 62, we explored that. And, uh, uh, the first thing I wanted to do, I said, uh, since there is such a tremendous uh, electrostatic phenomenon there, uh, I, I want to use it to to make a transitional uh, ion in a subvalent state uh, that is otherwise not possible. So <clears throat> I was looking by having a very large electrostatic field not compensated for by it, an adjacent anion means that you increase the electron affinity, the electron affinity of those ions. It wants to get reduced. It can't afford to stay in that high valence state unless it has the compensating ions associated with it directly. And because of that, uh, we all know that uh, uh, silver has a very stable monovalent ion. And it is because it has a second ionization potential about 22 eV, very high. The next best is cuprus. Well, cuprus, as uh, I recall now, uh, is something like uh, 20 EV second ionization potential. So I went to the books. What's next? That was nickel. And uh, nickel second ionization potential, as I recall, was 19 EV, and uh, cobalt was 18. So I put nickel. And uh, <coughs> I used it. <coughs> with uh, with uh, alkali now distilled it and uh, we got nickel one very stable it's a green compound it, it's a green colored thing it's a 3d9 system electronic system and I had the uh, spinners and spectroscopy established in my, my research group and uh, dr. Kasai who was outstanding his residence man he characterized it, and it was clearly identified. We knew exactly what the, where, where it is in the structure. We established nickel one ion in two particular positions, and that was the time when the Harry Gray of Columbia uh, was publishing about nickel one in the cyanide complex. And so I invited Harry to come and give a, a seminar. He did, and. Uh, I confronted him that uh, which one of us has a really nickel one ion. It turned out that uh, he did not have spin resonance, and probably the cyanide complex had a metal metal interaction. So our nickel one was a true 3 d nine electronic system, while the other one was probably a, a bivalent ion uh, by the virtue of a metal metal interaction. Then came the uh, really shocking uh, discovery that uh, I was trying to make at that point to, to isolate silver atoms in the zeolite. Uh, uh, because we were interested in the S-pin to see the, uh, the, the spin as an, use spin as an spectroscopy to characterize the silver atom as it wiggles in the, in the zeolite pores. By that I failed in. But uh, as we used the uh, First, large concentration of silver, I mean to say, like, like one, two, three percent. Uh, we didn't see anything. So I asked uh, my assistant, a uh, most wonderful uh, fellow, died uh, just two years ago, uh, Gary Skills. 
I told Gary, please go down, introduce one tenth of a percent silver, uh, otherwise sodium, and uh, introduce sodium vapor. Uh, maybe then we are able to isolate a single silver ion to prevent the formation of a doublet, but, which would be non-spin, of course, it would, uh, would share the electrons. And uh, I never forget it, Gary came in next day, he says, you, you come and look at this. And he made a product that was bright red, it was bright red. But then we sent for the, into the spec, looked at it in the spin spectrometer, and it had a magnificent 19 line spectrum. And it didn't take minutes to decide what that was, it's sodium 43 plus. It was a subvalent state of alkali uh, metal itself. And that uh, very quickly, knowing the structure and everything, it was clear that uh, in the so-called alpha cage, a large alpha cage of the YCOI, there's a tetrahedral set of sodium ions. <coughs> and uh, as we introduced uh, an electron by introducing a sodium ion, which resists the electron, and then itself it got lost the ion into the hidden structures of the zeolite. But that new electron that was inserted there was picked up by four equivalent sodium ions in a perfect tetrahedral position, crystallographically perfect position. So that created an electron uh, lobe uh, orbital about 12 angstrom size as clearly determined uh, without doubt by the spin, spin resonance structure which was a 19-line, perfectly symmetrical system. Sodium uh, nuclear moment is three half, so it was no question whatever. Uh, no question that the 15-line, 13-line, uh, thank you, 13-line signal depicting uh, uh, an electron as it is equivalently shared by four totally symmetrical set of sodium ions. <coughs> then the did the same thing to axiolite, we got sodium uh, 6, 5 plus, and the 19 line signal was, was quite, quite uh, exciting to see uh, this micro, micro laboratory to yield to us so, so well, entirely new, uh, new chemistry. And uh, well, while that was going on, uh, the, our original findings have been uh, received, understood, and, uh, and applied in the industry. And uh, as we all know, uh, YZOLITE uh, became uh, the largest single uh, catalyst application on Earth ever, and still is. And now we are looking back 40 years. Now at that time, Maybe. Turkevich was working on zeolites and EPR. Did you all interact or agree, disagree, or? Uh, no, we had no. I, I knew John very well as a friend, <laughs> but we had no scientific interaction. Uh, how would you describe Don Breck as a person? The first word I want to say, magnificent, lovely, that's hard thing to say for another man, but he was both. He was the creative, enormously simple, completely open, completely, or just a most wonderful human being. And uh, he was extremely generous, helpful. When I got there, he was already uh, with Milton. Under Milton, he was heading research and uh, he was a completely open, generous, wonderful fellow. And just look at his book that he wrote in the 1960s, it's about six, seven hundred pages book of his. It's still the Bible for everybody. He, that was, I have been spending a lot of time with Dan discussing every sort of thing. Uh, relevant things in the first 
three years that I spent in Buffalo Laboratory, then I was uh, offered a job that, that I took in, in New York. And uh, two years after I had been there, two, three, four years later, Don came also to the same laboratory, the Unicarbide Corporate Research Laboratory. And then he began to, read, uh, to write his book. Now, at that time, universities were undergoing great expansion. How, how did Union Carbide keep all of these talented people there? It was very exciting to work in a laboratory. First, at the Buffalo Laboratory, I found it, I came, I was an associate professor at a university in Europe, in Budapest. And did research uh, on the side at, at the research institute. So I was uh, used to extreme intensity in work. And uh, also was uh, acquainted with uh, people of outstanding character, like my boss, uh, Professor Varga, and I like people. And uh, I found uh, that environment uh, just extremely appealing. People were just outstanding, both professionally and otherwise. It was just a marvelous environment. And uh, the way, and they gave tremendous leeway to individuals to carry out their own ideas. And they, they let them go for a while themselves. That is exactly how Milton discovered synthetic zeolites. It was not a corporate plan, a strategic plan. <coughs> it was about Robert Milton, and uh, of course, this is my strong belief. This is how it is in the in the field of catalysis, and it will be that way in the future as well. Uh, that uh, uh, strategic plan, so on and so forth, is very, very important. But it's the individual that does make the difference. But today, research uh, seems to be much more directed and short term. It is. Uh, it, do you foresee <coughs> this changing or how can it change? Or? It's sickening. Oh. In my view, <laughs> it's, it's really not too fortunate to, uh, after saying uh, that since the war time, the United States, people of the United States have been able to, in every field of adventure, human adventure, science, arts, whatever. They have been progressing and just, uh, just blossoming in every direction in a, in a magnificent way. Every, in every department, uh, now things are cooled down, cooled down quite a bit. And opportunities, as they are given, presented to young people, I don't think that they have the same kind of a hope and dreams as, as we could have at that time. Even though business is very good, but the business heads don't think with the same deep breath. They don't take the same deep breath when they think of the future. Even though the opportunity is there, I don't know the reason, but it's very unfortunate. Uh, how would you describe Bob Milton as a person? The first word that comes to my mind is brilliant. Bob was a brilliant young man at the time with uh, uh, he came from John Hopkins as a PhD and uh, from the first day he had, he took up the job that I wasn't there at that time as yet, but what I heard, he was a himself, a mortar. He had ideas and he didn't wait to get uh, uh, management approval for too long. He just went in, spent his weekends. And this is how he discovered uh, real lines. He developed the concept that beat everybody else's concept for 200 years. And uh, very intensive, uh, well-established scientists, I don't want to name names, but who had been at that time working on it around the globe on this topic. And he came through 
Indeed, and after that, he has had the wisdom and the uh, to to direct the people uh, uh, in the right direction to cover the ground. Uh, even pick up a little guy from uh, 4,000, 7,000 miles away from Hungary. <laughs> and uh, I was sitting uh, uh, in, a, in my little room in Vienna when the telephone rang and somebody who spoke Hungarian and his laugh uh, asked for me. I said, that's me. And he said, Dr. Milton will talk to you. <laughs> he offered me a job right there at the phone while I was sitting in Vienna. And how, how did he hear about you? By your resume sent out? My resume. I send out resumes a lot of places. He obviously got one of those. And uh, he just offered me an, an outstanding in uh, uh, Saturday, that sort of thing. An outstanding job. Was that not, was, <laughs> was impossible to refuse. I didn't take it immediately, though, because I want to come to the United States as a free man. But within 24 hours, I sat to it as soon as I arrived. Now, where did you was that? Uh, extremely vibrant mind, interested in uh, new things. He, new adventure was everything for him. And he was uh, also interested to hire first rate people. He was always looking for the outstanding people to hire, and he, he certainly did find the people, not necessarily on the basis of, uh, uh, I don't know, name schools, uh, to take number one school, uh, best students, but he sure found people like Dan Breck, Flanagan, and, and some others. So he was, uh, he definitely was a visionary who uh, had uh, tremendous energy and, uh, and inspiration to the, to the future. Now, to go back uh, to Budapest, uh, early on, apparently, the Germans didn't control Hungary too strongly, but then they Germans, took over. Germans, you mean? Yeah, they, 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 they the were. The time, you mean? Yes, but then the last year or two, Right. That they cracked down. Did that, was right. that apparent to her? It was extremely dramatic, certainly extremely dramatic for me, because uh, I don't want to talk about the details, but one member of my family was, uh, the, the, the day the Germans came in, uh, they uh, put signs on the, on the walls of that anybody who can find my uncle, who that was, can shoot him to death. <laughs> So he was <coughs> looked uh, to, to be destroyed immediately. Uh, the, just to see the tragedy <laughs> of times, the same person who, who was, by the way, for his humanity and the uh, protection of the people who were uh, against the, uh, the uh, Hitler regime, he had the power to protect them, and he did. And uh, as soon as the communists came in, they arrested him too. First, they, they recognized him as a great man, uh, applauded and everything, and then they uh, arrested him, <laughs> put in a concentration camp. A year later, they released him, and then uh, two years later, they deported him to a, a rice field, work. He was over 60 to work in the rice field, and uh, he died in a heart attack. <laughs> so these, these are the sort of time. Myself, I was on the books of the secret police, as the way I, I understand it. I was an enemy of the, of the state. In fact, it was an amazing thing that uh, it was in 1953, I was 29, when I received the National Award, so of course it's award, at the Parliament, great the Hall of the Parliament by the head of state. <clears throat> and as soon as I got back to my room from that event, I was a bell was ringing. And uh, I go up, and there is a secret police captain there. 
uh, uh, the most dreaded uh, the, the characters. And it says, uh, Dr. Abo, I said, yes. I thought they are taking me already. And uh, he says, uh, I came here. And he called me sir, something like that. I never heard anything like that. Uh, we were, you know, as soon as seeing somebody like that, it was that already. 50% chance seeing somebody like that. He was in uniform. And he said, uh, I need your, to get your soldier book or something like that. We had a book that we had to carry with us all the time. And that said, and uh, so I had no idea what this man wants, but he wanted that book. So I, I looked for it and I gave it to him and he says, uh, he pulled another one from his pocket and gave it to me. And he says uh, that uh, I uh, came to replace it with another one. And uh, I, I was confused. I, I was expecting that they chain me and take me away. And I didn't know what that was. And uh, then uh, it took several hours before I, I came to my senses after this encounter, I looked into this book. In the previous one, it was written in that in case of call for military duty, I am only qualified for forced labor. But the new book didn't have that in it. That was the great advancement. But one day later, I was called by somebody, it must have been the secret police, says that we need a list of four of your <coughs> closest relatives. And uh, by then I knew what that means. So I wrote down my parents, my brother's name. And uh, what that was is that those would be exempted from <coughs> deportation. So <coughs> you know, can you imagine that the for those who got the Kosher Prize, the National Prize, they won't mur murder your closest relatives. <laughs> Is that an achievement? <laughs> so that's the kind of system that was, you know. Uh, so that was too late, actually, for my relative that, that was deported a year earlier. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about that. This is too disgusting to remember. Uh, you, you mentioned before we started, uh, you knew Ponitz while he was still oh, yes. in Czechoslovakia. That's interesting. It happened that in 1964 or 66, one of the other, doesn't matter, I was invited to participate in the second uh, Faraday discussion, Faraday discussions know of, mm -hmm. in the second very discussion on surface chemistry, surface science, with a paper. It was, they knew, uh, had an advanced notice of my work on sodium-40 plus, and and that sort of thing. So that was a, a good topic for the meeting. And uh, uh, when I was uh, attending that in England, that the, the meeting, I got an invitation from the Czech National Academy of Sciences, with a lecture in Prague. And so, I, uh, that gave me an opportunity then to switch over to Hungary as well. Anyway, I went there and, uh, and I met there several folks, and one of them was, uh, was Ponitz. He was not my direct host. Uh, I forgot the name of my host, doesn't matter. But it was an amazing thing that uh, I got into Prague, I was flying there from Berlin with an East German plane, I think. And as I landed in Prague, uh, the member of, of the National Academy uh, was waiting for me there. And I said, I have to get my bags. But that never came. They did not give me my bag from the East German airline. Actually, I got back my bag three days later when I was leaving. Then I got it back. They found it. They obviously went through uh, that bag with a tooth comb 
and they saw my slides. I'm sure that the secret police had a good time looking at the spin resonance spectrum of those sodium 40 plus that I had to draw myself, the 15 and 19 light spectrum. Anyway, uh, you asked me about Ponets, and uh, I was invited there by several times, two nights we spent together with three folks. One, I have a hard time remembering my host name. It was a was a fine gentleman. He worked. He was initiating work on zeolites. The uh, the other one was uh, Camille Clear, a most wonderful, a good friend of mine ever since. At from Lehigh University, I remember my advisory board of that department for a long time. And uh, Ponets. And uh, I remember sitting three of us, these folks, uh, together drinking beer. And the beer was being bought in a bad top <laughs> size tank. <laughs> and we just pulled it out from the huge tank. <laughs> Very outstanding beer, of course. Pilsen from Pilsen. And, uh, and they were just crying, really crying. That was in 1960 or six, I can't say which one, about the terrible conditions there. And uh, uh, within, I believe, one year, all three left, all three of them. And the opponents, of course, went to, to Holland, uh, uh, come here clear, came to the United States, and did magnificent work ever since, it's very sophisticated. Uh, spectroscopy, optical spectroscopy, and that sort of thing. And the third gentleman became professor at the University of Free Berlin, in West Berlin. Forgot that name. There wasn't Kazansky? No, no, Kazansky is in, in I, Moscow. No, I don't mean Kazansky. Uh -huh. I can't remember his name. He, he went to... Uh, Radovsky, you mean? No, uh, he went to Johns Hopkins University to, for a year, I think. Who was that? Uh, he, he did theoretical calculations. Kuteki. Who? Kuteki? Kuteki. No. No. He, he was at the Free Berlin University. Oh, okay. Now and that was in, in Prague still that I'm talking about. Yeah, the, but he was. left uh, okay. about that time. Right. That's right. Um, it, well, if you had just left Hungary in the 50s, you, you weren't apprehensive about going to these Iron Curtain countries in the 60s? I was terribly apprehensive. Actually, the story is that uh, it was after, well, in Prague, I had a formal invitation of the National Academy of Sciences so that was for Czechoslovakia, and I regarded that adequate uh, security. Right after that, I was going, I flew to Vienna, where I met my wife and my son, both three years old at that time. And uh, then we rented the car and went to Hungary the first time. Now that's quite a story, but uh, it might be boring for no. most people. Well, it was interesting. Uh, that was, of course, when I left Hungary. That's, actually, I didn't leave Hungary. I didn't go back, mm -hmm. so there's a difference there. But nevertheless, they took away uh, I think they took away, I'm not sure what they took away, citizenship or not, I'm not sure of that, but uh, they harassed my parents uh, so, so, so seriously after that. So that was a pretty bad thing there, obviously. So for me to, me to go back, uh, my wife, they born in, uh, is American, and I was a great, enormous interest to show our child to my parents back there, who couldn't come out yet mm -hmm. at that time. So I was an enormous uh, inclination to try to make the trip. And uh, so then one of my colleagues back at the university became a very big, important man. Uh, he became the secretary of education in the government. He became member of the party. But we worked together at the end of the war uh, in the same, in Professor Vargas' department, and we were friends. And who was that? Uh, uh, Dr. Polinsky. <laughs> and uh, 
he was also a very important man in the National Academy as well. And uh, so he wrote me a letter once and said that, why don't you come to visit? And I wrote him, because I don't dare. <laughs> it was as simple. So he did send me then a printed announcement of my lecture at the National Academy of Sciences. Two things left up, the title and the date. He says, you fill it out and I print it. I send it back to you. That's what he did. And so I got the formal invitation from the National Academy of Sciences of Hungary that had my lecture, my lecture was the same as I gave in England in the Faraday discussion. And uh, I remember as we drove in with a little Mercedes from Vienna into Hungary to the border, we saw these machine gun, gun placements. And my wife was very concerned, obviously. And uh, there came the guard uh, said, uh, take out the seats from the car. I said, I'm taking no seats out of anything. If you don't like the appearance, you don't permit me to enter, I turn back. I'm not taking any seats out of the car. So calm down. But it, that was the beginning. That was the welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. We were very too sick almost, really. It was extremely exciting, that trip, the <laughs> first time. And then the people were extremely nice, of course. It was just the, we just had to report to the police the first day. <laughs> All of us had to go there, show ourselves, that sort of thing. But the, the academy had the, I had my lecture there, and uh, everybody was extremely uh, friendly and so on and so forth. And I have been invited many times there, and a member of the Academy of Sciences of Hungary. They elected me uh, a few years ago. And I go attend their meet yearly meetings and we give, give many lectures. I will give one next year as well. So, <coughs> of course, by now there's no problem going to. But the first was very dramatic. Uh, we, we mentioned Tissery also. Uh, you had known him in Hungary, or you know him afterwards? Well, actually, it is a strange thing that uh, his grandfather and my grandfather were very, glo very close friends. And they both had the same boss, Emperor Franz Joseph. They both <laughs> worked in the, in the court of Emperor Franz Joseph. Austro-Hungarian Empire. They were both court officials. His, his grandfather was a, a three-star general. In fact, he was the head of the Imperial Guard of, of the um, of the Habsburgs. And uh, my grandfather was a counselor. Anyway, they were very good friends, and that friendship is now three generations old. That's how I know she said it. And his father was a general was, also? Uh, was played, no, no, he was a, no, he was not a general. He was an officer, and, and as a young man, I think he left Hungary at the end of the war and came to the United States, lived in England. And he's, he's, he died, I think, but his wife is still there. Mm -hmm. said his father is still, I think, in Cleveland. But uh, they were friends with my mother, uh, you know, so it <laughs> was a three generations. Now, in, in Hungary, uh, after the communists took over, was it essentially essential to join the party to move ahead in science? Oh, or? Absolutely. I think uh, I myself have never been a member of any party, not even as uh, any association in Hungary. I somehow decided myself that If one needs to face the terror, one must do it by self-respect. And it was really a life and death situation there, as I have known so many of my colleagues' situation. First of all was the uh, problem of Professor Varga himself. 
he was namely member of the government, uh, uh, that just before war was declared, and he voted always against uh, uh, war, everything. But he was such an enormously dominant person, almost in Hungarian science and technology. Uh, he was uh, certainly an outstanding candidate to be shot by the communists immediately. But somehow, he was exempted. And I remember those days uh, when he <laughs> was an interesting thing that, of course, the university burned down and his institute burned down. And uh, they had, from the last century, all kind of nice little things uh, made of platinum, like balances and uh, all sorts of uh, you know, scientific gadgets uh, uh, from the last century. So he had some 15 pounds of platinum, something like that, in his, in his uh, safe, which was in his office. It was kept there in his safe. And after the war, when he came in first, to the university after everything was in rubble. And the library, his office was beyond next to the library. In the library was a room twice this, probably full of thousands of books, it was completely burned. So that was just uh, five inches of ashes there. And then he went to his office, the door was uh, open, of course, and he saw already that the safe was blasted open. Nothing in it except all the platinum was thrown in the ashes. This ugly looking metal, you know, nobody wanted that. What they stole is the gold that the weights, you know, the standard weights that the gold did, stainless steel or whatever they were, that they all stole. All the platinum was there. So actually that uh, huge pounds of platinum was used to rebuild the institute, uh, uh, to buy Mortar and <laughs> you know <laughs> things like that, electricity and wiring. I did wiring too myself. There, night time. Now you mentioned you met Brunauer when he came to Hungary. Oh, I, I just yeah, just I, I saw him. Uh -huh. I was standing there. I remember I saw him once. He visited Professor Varga. I was a student still. It was in '45. Yes. Now were there other people from the U.S. that? came to Hungary to make an inventory of scientists, or he, he was the only he one? He was the only one I, I can recall. Uh, what was Vienna like when you were there? Uh, it was possible. still a divided city, or? It well, it was just gotten free, you see, and it was not divided anymore. Uh, the Russians got out, and uh, so it was, it was a free, free city. It was uh, the Russians left few months earlier, that was the deal uh, that their foreign secretary called Figo was the name of the fellow. The story goes in Vienna that he made the deal with Yerusha. Uh, after a very long dinner, by the time they did slide, naturally, uh, under the table, that's <laughs> how Figo, he drank a little less. <laughs> Push that paper in the hands of Khrushchev. That's the story. Obviously not true, but uh, that's what they like to tell you. Now, how would you describe Professor Varga? <clears throat> I think I would call him uh, the best I could characterize him, a grand seigneur. Grand seigneur. Grand gentleman. <clears throat> a man of... Uh, Tremendous vision, tremendous sight forward, and tremendous generosity. I uh, could not be more fortunate that to be plugged by him uh, to, to be educated on what is science, what is technology, how to look at it, how to approach it. Because he has done it himself, and he had this tremendous uh, uh, quality as a human being. He came from an extremely poor little family himself. His uh, father was a shoe repairman, to the best of my knowledge. But he, to me, is the grand seigneur, as you call a, a French duke. He was such a man.
<coughs> and he uh, he introduced me uh, uh, after the after he I got my degrees. Uh, then he just took me uh, to the industry. Uh, beside the working at the university, I gave my lectures to 400 students. In fact, engineers regularly, and uh, uh, then. Uh, with his reputation, he was invited by uh, everybody, and uh, we went to two industries. One was uh, ammonia uh, industry, ammonia synthesis industry, which also had a refinery in it. And that company uh, was one uh, that we visited, and they immediately invited us to establish a laboratory with their help, with their financial help to research in hydrocarbon uh, chemistry. That was in 1958 or something like that. And Exxon was next, uh, the Hungarian uh, uh, Department of Exxon. Uh, I had a consultant contract and Professor Varga. Uh, two of us were consulting for them with the purpose of establishing a research laboratory uh, in, uh, in Hungary for Exxon to work in the field of uh, hydrocarbon rearrangements, uh, uh, dehydrogenation, and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, I made my first trip to the, to the oil fields where the lab would have been uh, established when overnight the Kami system nationalized the, uh, the well, industry. All industry, not exempt, all industries. And we were thrown out. That's the last time I have been there. I was there once, and the last time. That was in 1957, sometime. And then they, then they arrested the chairman of the, of the Exxon Hungary, who was a, a great geologist. Uh, and I remember that Professor Vargo, myself, and other professors at the university, we supported the families for years, every month. We gave up. We didn't have that much, but we supported the, the heads of Exxon. Uh, two persons at Exxon, the chairman and, uh, and another person, as well as another professor who was Professor Nare, who was a crystallographer at the university. It took four years to get them freed. They got freed after Stalin died, so four or five years after that. Now, when you were at uh, Union Carbide, I understand you tried to interest petroleum companies in Zeolites uh, by visiting a lot of labs. You want to well, describe? We went uh, with Tudor Thomas, who was my direct boss uh, at, uh, at Union Carbide. He was vice president in charge of the zeolite business uh, and research and everything else. And uh, Tudor and I visited 12 uh, petroleum research labs in the United States. And I don't want to uh, be specific, and I don't want to call companies or names, but the reception was ho-hum at best, I would say, with the exception of two places. Uh, that is, everywhere they had a tremendous concern about the diffusivity of such things. They, they didn't think that was our impression that such things as having, within a crystal, having eight extra pores that has any practicality. That was, uh, that was, uh, uh, I think, the main part of the response from, and that includes most of the world's largest refineries. And uh, two exception, it's obvious, uh, one that developed the FCC process, I don't name, but everybody knows, and the other one that together with us, uh, developed the hydrocracking process with zeolites. And I never forget it that uh, uh, after making all these trips, I thought that I'm not going for another trip out in California. I just sent them a, uh, the expressed interest in letters. And so I sent a sample of y zeolite, each y zeolite, under secrecy, so they couldn't analyze it. And uh, I just sent the sample to them. And it took a month or so that the chairman of that company, 
called up the president of Union Carbide Corporation, who never heard of me uh, at that time, and said that uh, I want to come next week with my lawyers to draw an agreement between us about the use of your uh, zeolite catalyst in hydrocarbon. <laughs> well, my president found out pretty quickly <laughs> what, <laughs> what is he talking about. He became, uh, we have been Union Carbide then and more recently, uh, UOP and then have been uh, in collaboration to develop the application of zeolites in hydrocracking, which we began uh, in the 50s, really. Actually, I used the palladium first time mm -hmm. in industry in, for such things. I, I have done enough work in the lab that it seemed to me that uh, palladium is a lot cheaper than platinum, and that palladium will do the job. And it sure did. We had probably the application of palladium based zeolites in hydrocracking with great advantage, of course, in, in economy. Uh, but the rest of the industry, even late, years late, they simply didn't believe that uh, the diffusivity. They may have had, of course, other talks because uh, uh, such a uh, presentation from a company from another industry was a very cold affair. You, know, you were allowed to come in, invite uh, for the last little bit, and they would sit there, ask no questions. And of course, we didn't tell them what the, the catalyst was. So they didn't know it's, there is a zeolite, uh, there is a new zeolite in it. We didn't tell them anything about it at that time. That first disclosure was at the Second International Congress on Catalysis, where I presented a paper disclosing the existence of the biseolite as well as its catalytic properties. That's when the world heard the first time that there is a biseolite and what it does. Now, uh, the filtro and the problems there. Uh, I want to do that very cautiously. Yes, it's one still. One must. It's over, but uh, it's not. I want to be cautious. <laughs> uh, there was a lawsuit, and uh, what I can say about it is that uh, they have been manufacturing YZO. That was back in the 60s, early 60s, and Union Carbide sued them, and uh, they were uh, they were sued on the base of violation of, uh, of three of our patents. One was the sodium Y composition matter, Don Breck was the discoverer, and two patents that uh, I was the, uh, the first, uh, first uh, discoverer. One was the composition matter of multivalent cadmium uh, Y0 and the uh, H form of Y0 both had a great variety of applications in addition to the composition matter. So every application on Earth has been covered there in those, those three. And uh, after four years uh, that involved very big names as consultants and everything on both sides, seven lawyers on the opposing side, and me spending uh, months <laughs> in Los Angeles going back and forth for years on court, in and out of court. We won the case both first degree as well as in, in, in a field. And they, uh, they were to make the, uh, the, the royalty payments they had been missing uh, in, within 24 hours, as I recall. I have seen the check. I was invited to see the check. They arrived between 24 hours. Very, very, very big check. <laughs> but I don't want to say more than that. Uh, did United Cat uh, Union Carbide uh, interact with other petroleum companies, or did you pretty much stay apart from petroleum companies and just provide zeolites? No. Uh, but that was uh, <coughs> sort of in between. There was, as I mentioned, uh, there was no secret, really, uh, 
a, a basic agreement for joint development and business between Unicarbide Corporation and Unocal in Los Angeles. Uh, that uh, was a most happy uh, interaction in both in science personally as well as in business. We developed to, together the application of zeolites in hydrocracking. Uh, mostly we were, the Union Carbide side was doing the research on the material, and they, as an as a operating refining company, they were making a major contribution. They also made significant contribution to the catalyst, but they provided the process uh, component. So they, they, we, we worked together for decades uh, along those lines. Very, very happy indeed. And that took two, two major sequences. One is to, uh, to develop a, a zeolite catalyst that generates gasoline. That was on the base of the first catalyst I provided in 1958, I believe, uh, with some small but, small but significant modifications. And then the later was a discovery that was all the I, I was the key uh, discoverer on the patent. Uh, a, another form of uh, zeolite uh, that is uh, used as a catalyst to make diesel oil from heavy feedstocks. So these are the two major divisions in, in hydrocracking. Make gasoline to make diesel oil. Now, did the atmosphere that was at Lindy change dramatically when you moved to Terrytown, or was that able to be carried there? Well, actually, I should say that <coughs> I worked for Union Carbide, the Lindy division, from 1957 to 1960. From 1961, I uh, worked, uh, managed catalysis for the corporate research department at Territan, a uh, little bit north of New York City. And uh, at uh, some time along the, when the 70s hit, uh, the corporate research was, which was big in the 60s, uh, was declining around the, around the United States for sure. Uh, significantly, and uh, it was declining at Union Carbide as well. And uh, I was uh, looked up in 1974 by my friend and former boss, uh, Tudor Thomas, who was the head of the business, uh, Zillite business. He himself was a chemist. And uh, he said that we had enough fun uh, to, to calculate and back calculate and so the 40 plus thing like that but business needs you so he he asked me to go back and to have catalysis for the zeolite business which i did 1974 and uh, i was there and i was a senior corporate research fellow for union carbine in charge of catalysis for the zeolite business and then when UOP was bought 50-50% between Union Carbide and Allied Signal. Uh, I went with that whole business onto UOP very happily. And actually, I was given the same title at both, co both companies all along while I was uh, active uh, with the objective to see if I could further interaction between the, in technology between the two organizations, which I did. So I had the same identical title in both organizations. Of course, I retired by now uh, in 1962, and uh, I believe, and I'm, I have been consulting for both for a while, and now I'm consulting for UOP as well. Uh, what, what was the biggest change when UOP took over, or it became uh, UOP. Uh, UOP is a world most successful technology company in the field of petroleum technology and has all the wherewithals 
to not to discover things alone, but to bring them into commerce. That was a huge difference. At Union Carbide, the management had all the wherewithal to do something new in chemistry, in specialty chemicals or basic uh, uh, or organic chemicals, that is. It had all it took to do to make polyethylene. It was time that Union Carbide in-house made half of the world polyethylene and uh, many other uh, in that side. All sorts of huge products were of key interest. Of course, it had all sorts of divisions, stainless steel, all sorts of things. It was a big, complex company. Later, it shedded some of those. <coughs> but to get into the petroleum business uh, technology, it didn't have all the strength it required. It would have benefited from, naturally. But UOP did. So that was an extremely wise and happy move, and certainly helped the uh, helped UP uh, by taking in all the zeal and chemistry and technology to further the cause uh, at UP. And of course, Union Carbide benefits because it owns half of it. That was an extremely good move no, in all respect. UOP seems to still have that. Uh innovative uh, philosophy, is that just an appearance or? No, no, it's, it's the way it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a remarkable outfit. It does have free-ranging research. It does within objectives, of course, because mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of dollars you, you can spend, but it's not small, it's very big. But it does have the engineering. The engineering component is just as strong and just as innovative. The kind of research that is the creative input onto the, onto the conception of how to use a new piece of chemistry is just as strong. And the quality of the people is comparable, the same, in both fields. So it's not to mention that uh, the marketing end is, again, I don't I'm not sitting here to advertise, uh, even though they are my best friends, and so on and so forth. I have very, very happy years with UOP. But uh, that's what it is. It has all the components it takes. Yeah. And it doesn't have an enormous uh, manufacturing authority. It, the, the chairman, I mean the president, can focus on what is important, and that's always technology. Uh, by not having uh, a product to sell directly and but manufacture. It does, of course, it does, does have. I mean, yeah. all the zeola catalyst adsorbents and whatnot. That's not, not but it's very big. But does that uh, let them maintain that spirit of the 50s, or is there something else that you can identify? Perfect. I don't want to overstate anything that I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's the way I feel, but, you know, I have been at UOP not too many years, really. What was it? Uh, two, three, four years, I think, uh -huh. you know, when I retired. But they said, uh, I, uh, we want you to, before, a year before I retired, they said, we want you to work for us as a consultant. And uh, after that, so uh, it, I have <laughs> not really left yet. <laughs> so I, I know some, uh, quite, a, quite a bit about the organization, and it does take quite a it does have what it takes, has everything that is needed. And it doesn't have uh, that enormous involvement in manufacturing and whatever that is. Uh, so that everybody in the management and the lab is focusing on technology. That's the only thing that is. Now, to go back to Union Carbide when you were trying to develop zeolites, uh, it, it seems zeolites didn't get applied in catalysis of organic catalysis. Yes. Uh, is there a reason, or it, it's starting to be applied now? But uh, uh, let me tell you uh, that uh, there was one discussion that uh, lowered the site of giving carbide management onto the applicability of zeolites as a big new business. Uh, 
we discovered everything by then with the Visio line, that is, we had the base of those, all of the key patents. And uh, then the management invited the consultant in the field of FCC, uh, cavity tracking, and the consultant came in and uh, we did, I did tell him what the sort of thing we know that we have a catalog that much more active, I mean much more active, and use more uh, product too, more gasoline. That's very, very good indeed. We have very high expectations. And uh, so he was asked that, uh, how to proceed in this. Well, he said that, uh, well, you see that uh, the cost of uh, a pound of FCC cap, this is 14 cents a pound. Uh, that was in 1957, 1958, probably, when that conversation took place. And uh, you were saying that you really have uh, major improvements here, that you got more product and, uh, and uh, much more activity. Well, he says, I could envision that uh, he would sell this thing for 17 cents a pound. By the way, what's the cost of the product? One dollar. <laughs> that killed it. That, that stupid conversation <laughs> killed it. It was before that time when it became obvious that the catalyst cost is utterly meaningless. Value added is the only thing that matters. And of course, we all know that the application of, of YZOI in FCC uh, yielded on the average $4 billion value added every year. Yearly benefit to humanity is $4 billion net value added for every year. Uh, and, and that was, uh, at that point, that fellow just closed his books. He <laughs> says a dollar. <laughs> he, was, he was a guest that we had talked to him. <laughs> but it did affect management at that point. Of course, management of, of, of that huge corporation was keyed onto new basic organic chemicals that could interest them infinitely. And I have long stories about the Ziegler process application, so on and so forth. That was a, these were the important things. And Union Carbide had uh, many laboratories, uh, like a dozen laboratories, and some of them were truly cutting edge in science. Uh, in Cleveland, there was a laboratory uh, of Union Carbide at the so-called metals division. And they, was, they were doing really cutting edge field emission, field ionization, and microscopy they were developing. Uh, but that, that was done to support uh, science technology for ethane oxide, silver catalyst. So there was no limitation that was not exerted, expanded, and no talent that wouldn't be employed to understand the science better for uh, ethane oxide catalyst. That was the number one issue. But uh, applying into the petroleum technology and one dollar versus 14 cents, that was a little too dramatic <laughs> to envision that its value added counts not the cost of the catalyst. I'm not intending any critique because uh, who knows if I were the, <laughs> the, the you, manager, well, what, what I would have said. Now, but, who, uh, who did you work with at UOP or at uh, Unical? Uh, John Ward was my John friend. John Ward, uh, sure. Uh, very, very close friend all, all the years. Very, very close friend and worked together very, extremely successfully. Uh, the two organizations have worked together. And, and then later, of course, uh, you will be bought that part of you, Unocal right now. <laughs> We had an extremely uh, happy and extremely successful uh, work there. Of course, we had controlled the patents. Uh, my patents expired in 1980, 1981. We were fortunate that 
those original Wiseolite patents uh, were conceived even by the patent office, that is our conception of the interpretation of the events, that even though we have gotten the data and filed it uh, in the 1958, I believe, we obtained the patents only in 1964. It was uh, always dribbled back and forth a little bit, kept alive without uh, before uh, the uh, issuing. And that was, of course, I'm just saying, probably deliberate on, on behalf of the, our corporation to extend the life of that patent, indeed. So they began at uh, 64, we got them. I, I, I have been many times in the patent office, of course, uh, in those in those times. And it was obvious that they also regarded them as a, a tense of enormous importance. So they have been ex extra careful. So this uh, took six, seven, seven, seven years to get them granted. And that extended the life, went into the 80, 81. But then, of course, that's free, free chase mm -hmm. for everybody. Now did. For the, from the basic. Composite matter point of view. But, but in manufacture, were you so far ahead that it still is, you're still the dominant Y zeolite? Or? Bert, I beg you off. I, I, I rather not get into that for several reasons. One, I may not even know. I'm a consultant over uh -huh. the years now. I'm not an operator. And I, I kind of doubt that that, that would be wise for me to come and talk. So let me get out of that. Now, how did you end up uh, working on the hydrocracking type catalyst? Uh, well, the choice was obvious. Uh, I think from the very first day I entered uh, this, uh, this job in 1957, uh, they were for application, uh, that was isomerization and hydrocracking looked like the, the most desirable applications and, and cracking became obvious as soon as we made the first experiment, which then we covered. So that was no, no problem, particularly because it was my, my very early work with palladium showed that, uh, that palladium was extremely effective hydrogenating agent and that it sufficiently withstands uh, uh, the sulfur nitrogen poisoning uh, in, in actual feedstocks that, uh, uh, that his uh, bifunctional catalyst was, was certainly one of the most inviting things with zeolites because they certainly provided the acidity, we all know that, but they also had outstanding supports for select node numbers. So bifunctional catalysis was acid looked applicable in the industry, hydrocracking certainly uh, stuck out like a sore thumb. But, but it really hadn't been established in industry at that time. Well, uh, well actually, the, I have to remember precisely that I was reading, of course I had been reviewing all that stuff at that time, and we had a marketing effort too, uh, so I could ask questions and, and uh, I could get answers to those questions, but I well remember that at the time uh, we made those first works, uh, discovering why zeolites, uh, the Chevron had four or five such units, hydrocracking units, and I read about them. And uh, Unocal also had commercial uh, hydrocracking at a smaller scale at that time. So there was uh, Chevron and Unocal. So that was a uh, a, a sprouting new industry, uh, new new technology that was ready to burst, and uh, the benefits were quite obvious. Uh, the stability of the catalyst and the uh, and the yield benefit, mainly the stability of the catalyst and uh, and uh, some of the quality of the yield. I knew well. Now that you asked, I forgot, but now I can tell you why I thought of hydrocracking. It is when you do some refining, you, you, you convert with conversion, 
then you take some heavy feedstock, you make some useful, more useful uh, light feedstocks, some more fuel. What you don't want to do is to make any gas. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was watching in those experiments. And uh, I remember precisely how in the first experiments, I was watching the C1, C2. And uh, I had that article that Chevron published at that time about the C1, C2s as well as the other products. And I observed that we made one-tenth of what they did. So I knew we had, we had a breakthrough for that field. That was the that business was I now remember well. That knowledge of the great reduction of the C1, C2. Of course, the uh, reason is obvious that the activity was so much more, the temperature was so much lower, than the any radical type uh, product was just wiped out. And of course, that's very beneficial because you in a hydrocracking, you have to bring the hydrogen around. And uh, to separate methane from hydrogen is not so cheap. So if you want to recycle the hydrogen, it's of great importance how pure it is. So by blowing into it, I mean generating into it, uh, a lot of methane, that makes it very costly. So that by itself was an important issue technologically. Well, we've used up this tape.